Okay, I think it's time to uh, start. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay. So let me introduce myself for those who don't know me. I'm uh, Bart van Wees. Uh, uh, I'm from the group Physics of Nano Devices from the Zernike Institute of Advanced Materials in Groningen, uh, in, uh, up in the north. It's a pleasure for me uh, to have been asked to give this uh, to give this masterclass on graphene. Obviously, you would have preferred André Geim uh, giving it. Yes, uh, but uh, uh, I guess he's very busy. But certainly tomorrow you, uh, you will be able to hear him. So what I like to do is, is to have a little bit of an informal uh, presentation. So please interrupt me. I have also there a whiteboard, which I will try to use. Uh, so please interrupt me if there are any questions. So I'm actually aiming on, let's say, uh, a person who has heard about graphene, has heard a few things about graphene, uh, and likes to know a little bit more, especially also likes to know a bit about the background. What is all the fuss about? Is this now a magic material or not? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So clearly, uh, graphene has, has received some new attention by the Nobel Prize of last year given to Andrei Chaim and Kostya Novoselov. And read carefully for groundbreaking experiments regarding the two-dimensional material graphene. So I will show you some groundbreaking experiments. I can already tell you that those experiments are not necessarily very complicated. So I will show to you some device of graphene. Well, I believe it's graphene made from some kitchen foil cotton wool, some graphite, and I will show you, uh, well, at least I will, I will try and convince you that this is related to graphene. Okay, let's start. André Geim, that's him. You see his age, very, very young. So the nice thing about this Nobel Prize, of course, is that it shows that you do not have to be retired or uh, well, already in your 70s or whatever, not productive anymore before you get the Nobel Prize. You can already get it when you're in the prime of your life and you're in the prime of your, of your scientific career. And of course that holds for André Geim, that holds even more from, for Kostya Novoselov, because as you see, he's only 36. So, I have to say a little bit more. Uh, Clearly, the achievements which they have, have obtained were done at the University of, Ma of Manchester, uh, but there is a very interesting Dutch connection, and I will show that here because it's also related uh, to several aspects of the work of, of André Geim and Kostya Novoselov. So, what you see here, this is a big magnet. It's from the High Field mag ma Magnet Lab in Nijmegen. Uh, so, what is, it? what is it? It's a bitter type of magnet. So, well, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but basically it's built up by basically a circular plate through which a, a huge current is, is sent. And this current, of course, is very huge because you see already if it runs, it consumes about 70 megawatts of electricity. So you see that the electricity bill, uh, that is, of course, of great concern in, in that lab. So uh, what you also need, obviously, is to get rid of this dissipated power. So these are supplies for water cooling, and this is the return. And, and so clearly that consumes basically a few uh, cubic meters of cooling water per second. So what is now the goal of such a magnet? First of all, to produce a large field. That's pretty clear. But there is some also, also some interesting feature in that, in that it has a bore, as it's called, which is at room temperature. And so you can basically you have a space of about in this case 32 millimeters, which is relatively large, in which you can put whatever you like. And uh, I should of course here refer to, to some interesting uh, link with André Geim, because about uh, 10 years ago he received what is called the Ick Nobel Prize. Uh, the ceremony for the Ick Nobel Prize, I believe, is a few weeks ahead of the, uh, of the Nobel Prize. And this is supposed to be some kind of parody on the Nobel Prize, but with a little bit of serious undertone. Eh? Because uh, uh, this, this prize is given for research achievements that first make people laugh and then make them think, 
or, well, sometimes uh, is given for achievements that cannot or should not be reproduced. So he received the, 2000, uh, the year 2000 physics prize together with Michael Berry, Sir Michael Berry, I should say here, and uh, because he will appear further on in the story as well, uh, for an interesting experiment, and that is making levitating a frog. So let me show you how it works. And now I have a nice movie. So here is this levitating frog in this huge magnetic field. Well, I believe that the frog survived uh, the experiment. Uh, but of course you could say, well, what is, now the, what is now the fuss about? Well, I can show you what is the fuss about. Because if you try to levitate something, you will not succeed. Eh? So I have two magnets. I try to levitate one. By, pulling, by putting the North Pole against the North Pole, and you see I cannot get any stable, eh? I cannot get any stable situation because it will basically flip. And that is actually given, there is a theorem about it, and it's called Earnshaw's theorem, which says that you cannot make any stable levitation or a stable suspension of any magnets or any, any, uh, any uh, electrostatic arrangement. You cannot make a stable uh, how would I say? Well, let me sh let me just show you what I mean. Well, let me show you. Let me continue here. So this is Earnshaw's theorem. What is important is that you have, if you have any magnetic forces, permanent magnets or permanent uh, charges, you cannot make a stable arrangement uh, of w which makes things levitate. Clearly, this is an exception, eh? because otherwise this frog would not levitate. So there's something special going on, and that special effect is diamagnetism. Yeah, because the magnet, magne magnetic field actually induces a circulating current in the frog, which actually produces a magnetic field. And you can actually show that the combination of this, this magne big magnetic field plus uh, the, mag the magnetic field generated by this diamagnetism can indeed produce a stable situation. So, well, what else can you make levitate? Let me just show you. I think it's... This is a levitating strawberry. You can actually do some more. Let me go. You can also levitate something, and I did not know that it is was possible, because remember, eh, so this 33 Tesla magnet, that's a really big thing. Uh, this is just a tabletop arrangement. So you have just a configuration of magnets. Well, here, this is the North Pole up. This is the South Pole up. And there is the third one is, again, North Pole up, South Pole up. And what is floating here is graphite. So let me show you this one. It's just so here we see basically a piece of graphite, which is again levitating via the same principle, eh? the same principle of, of diamagnetism. So it's not, this diamagnetism obviously is not a very, uh, a very rare phenomena. It happens in most, in most materials. What is of course special is that you can do a tabletop experiment here. And of course most of you probably have seen a very similar experiment, but then with superconductors. Yeah, but of course then the diamagnetism is indeed very strong. Yeah, because in, superconduct in superconductors basically all the magnetic flux is expelled. Here only part of it is expelled, but nevertheless uh, it still works. Uh, even with non-superconducting materials. Excuse yeah? can, can you explain to me why it is that it's so stable, that it doesn't rotate compared to the frog or the strawberry? Uh, that is because the frog moves. <laughs> but the strawberry doesn't move and yet it rotated. Okay. It's a very good question because uh, I'm not sure if you have seen the experiment <laughs> with the high TC superconductor, right? Because then it's basically the same arrangement. Of course, you have to cool it with liquid, with, with liquid nitrogen. And then you also have some typical movement like this. So I do not know exactly the an what the answer is. Basically, the, 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 the motion is probably given by, by some damping. Yeah? Because if it starts to move, then uh, in a magnetic field, basically, you generate some so-called eddy currents, which damps the motion. So. But I'm not 100% sure which is the, if this is the full answer. But what the only thing I can say is that this typical motion is very much the same whatever you levitate. So, okay, graphite. 
So this sounds like a very boring <coughs> material, eh, because uh, as a matter of fact, until a few years ago, uh, people were basically interested in graphite, obviously for using it in pencils, eh? pencil lead, pot loaden. It is a very known material as a moderator in nuclear reactors because it slows down the neutrons, which you need uh, basic to have the, uh, to have the uh, well, let's say the multiplication effect in the nuclear reactors. It has obviously has a layered structure, and of course that is the reason why you can write. You can easily take off layers of, well, let's still call it graphite, it is used in the steel making industry. Uh, part of the graphite which we actually use for, uh, for making these graphene devices actually comes from, uh, from the steel making industry. Well, it's a good lubricant for the same reasons. And of course, it's also very important, it's a very good electrical conductor. So, this is a slide which I borrowed from, uh, from André Geim, because I think it's a very nice one because it shows the history. Well, here we have the graphite, and clearly it's made of layers, and these layers are called graphene. Eh? So, what is, what is very typical is that you have a carbon atom which is connected to only three neighbors. So, it's very different from diamond, because then we have a carbon atom, then we have two carbon atoms sitting there and two sitting there. Uh, that basically has four neighbors, so in a very primitive way, and I think you can even justify it, you can say, well, carbon has four electrons to make bonds, in diamond they are all used, and here I have only, I need three electrons to make bonds with the adjacent atoms, and then one, one electron is free and can actually move through the, uh, through the layer. Obviously it can also move in this direction, but it's a bit more complicated. Eh? So if you measure, for instance, in graphite, you measure the electrical conductance in this direction, I think it's about a factor of 10 to 100 times better than in, in, than in this direction. So this is known material, but the strange thing is that was what was basically known, uh, well, basically the first, let's say, non-trivial material which was known was buckyballs. Right? So they're called after uh, Buckminster Fullerene, who actually designed buildings like this. And you see again, you have this, this, this triple coordination here. In this case, you have an alternation of, 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 uh, of hexagons and pentagons. And it's actually, it's very much like a soccer ball. It's actually the same, exactly the same. C60 is exactly the same. So this was basically the first type of, let's say, non-trivial carbon material to be discovered. And then, a little bit later, people found carbon nanotubes. They are not very rare, because if you have a candle and you, have, you make it a bit sooty, uh, and you collect the soot, and you start to look carefully, you find that, that these, these buckyballs and these carbon nanotubes are actually produced. Uh, so it's not a very rare material. What is a bit surprising is that this material basically was isolated only so late, uh, only, well, five years ago. So I think the story is a bit, I will, I will give a bit the story why this was so. It also said it was presumed not to exist in the free state, uh, which is always a bit of a mystery uh, why, this, why this would be. Suppose you have a 2D material, people say, well, if, you, if I basically look at all the possibilities for vi lattice vibrations and I add up everything, basically the whole thing diverges. Uh, so this material would not be stable. But of course that's a bit of a tricky argument, because if you peel it off from some other material, if you peel it off from graphite, it might take a long, long, long time before it basically disintegrates. It could be a lifetime of the universe. Uh, so this, uh, this argument is, is, is not a very valid one. Okay. This is a nice one. This is what's made by, uh, by uh, a postdoc of mine. Uh, it was made somewhere in 2008 and actually describes the number of publications on graphene as a function of time. Hey, you see well, high, the high impact journal, Nature Science, and you see a bit more, well, Physics Phys of Letters is also a, a nice journal, Phys of B obviously also. Uh, so what you see, this is the evolution of the number of the pub publications in graphene as a function of time. And well, here it's not yet exponential, but here you see some kind of exponential growth. And of course, I should remember, remind you that this was actually made somewhere in the middle of 2008. Uh, so the, the total number of publications in 2008 was already here. And obviously we are, well, far, 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 far above this. So, and of course, this is the important paper. Uh, this was the paper by uh, Novoselov Geim, actually who would basically triggered this entire thing. Eh? This is why they got basically the Nobel Prize. I will 
You, but to look at it, it says electrical f electric field effect in atomically thin carbon films. It doesn't say, say single. It doesn't say a single layer. Uh, because the funny thing is that this experiment very likely was not done on a single layer of graphene. It was still multi multi layer of graphene. And only one year later, in 2005, they, uh, well, Novoselov and Chaim, together with another group, could actually show that they could measure a single layer. And I will show you how this works. Here we entered, uh, my group entered the uh, graphene arena somewhere here. You could say that was a bit too late, but fortunately the, uh, that uh, if, if the curve would really go like this, uh, we would already have uh, well approached the end of the S-curve, but fortunately, of course, we are still going up. Okay, this is what I like to, uh, to discuss with you. Uh, obviously, it's only a tiny fraction of what can, what can be discussed about graphene. I have to make a choice, uh, also a bit of a consistent choice. Uh, so let me, I will give some introduction into electronic properties of graphene. How do I make a graphene device? Of course, how, how do we use this, this famous scotch tape method? What is this anomalous quantum Hall effect? Huh? Which was actually the proof that you could make, uh, a sing well, uh, make and measure a device huh, which is only based on a single layer of carbon, a single layer of graphene. Bilayer graphene, you can go turn the story back. If you can make a single layer, you can also two make two. What is the difference? How does it behave? What this is a game you can play with graphene. You can suspend it. Yeah? So you can make a device which can consist of a suspended single layer of, of atoms. And I will show you how it works and what we can do. There is some nice games which you can play with graphene. Electron optics, optics I would basically call it. I will show you an example here. A few applications of graphene, and then uh, probably in the second hour I will discuss what we are doing with graphene. We are not, well, of, cor of course we are also looking in electronic properties, uh, where you use the charge of the electron, but of course we are also going to use some other property, which is the spin. Uh, so we are going to do spintronics in graphene. And I will end with do-it-yourself graphene. Okay, there is a lot of mystery, uh, well, there are a lot of mysterious words about graphene. It almost looks like it's, a, it's not a real material, it's something magic. Uh, however, we should realize that it's basically a very nice example of a solid state material. So I would like to summarize a little bit what we basically should know or should remember for, from, uh, from solid state physics. So first of all, hey, we have a, a nice periodic lattice of atoms. So that means that the electrons basically experience periodic potential. Eh? Well, I, I write down x, eh? this is one coordinate. Of course, this could be basically also r. It could be x, y, and z. It doesn't matter. Hey, basically, the potential is periodic and with a lattice period A. And now there is a very important theorem, which is called Bloch's theorem, that if you now want to calculate the, the wave functions quantum mechanically, you can actually write them like this. You can say the wave function is a product of a wave function here. This is a wave function which actually describes the wave function on the scale of the, of the unit cell, but basically repeats itself. And so this is a true periodic wave function, and it's modulated by some envelope wave function, which looks like a plane wave. And so this is, the, this is basically the expression for a wave function of a free electron. And so this is already very interesting. And of course, here I describe that the uh, uh, that the this basically tells you that this at least this part of the wave function is periodic with period A. But the, the entire wave function, of course, is not, hey, because it's modulated by by this factor. What is this thing? This is the wave factor. So this is a very important parameter. It's also very important because it's related to a property of the uh, of the of the electron, which is called the crystal momentum or the quasi momentum. It's just given by, by taking this wave number and multiply it by h bar. Why is this so important? Because if I now apply a force on this electron which is moving in this periodic potential, it basically, uh, it, this, this momentum or the time derivative of the momentum basically obeys Newton's second law right, for a free particle. It's very strange because, I mean, this is a very complicated problem here, the electron feeling this periodic potential and moving around. Nevertheless, for this 
quasi, qua, uh, well, this quasi-momentum, I just have the equation that the time derivative of the momentum is equal to the applied force, eh, which can be electric field. It can also have, this is the uh, uh, Lorentz force. So this is a very special feature and also a very nice feature. What you can also get is a band structure. Well, you will get, so you will get a set for each value of k, each value of the wave factor, you have a set of states uh, at different energy, uh, which are labeled by n, which are called the bands. And this is also an important one. We have a group velocity. If you now really want to know the, the velocity of the particle, you have to take the derivative of the energy uh, with respect to k. And I will show you how this works. Again, this is good old solid state physics from, uh, from, from, well. So now, why did I emphasize this? Because now you can look at the difference between a metal, a semiconductor, and, and graphene. So this is the energy, this is the momentum. So this is a typical, well, artist impression of a metal. You see that the energy de depends on the momentum, well, in a parabolic way. Eh? It goes with the momentum squared. And we immediately recognize this because this is the expression for the kinetic energy. There is only, of course, one important difference, because if you would have a free electron, of course, the mass would be the 9 times 10 minus 31 times the kilogram, which is the, the mass of a free electron. Here it's modified. Now we get an effective mass. It's modified, again, because this electron is moving in this lattice. But there's no problem here. This, this is simply a particle moving with some positive effective mass. This is a semiconductor. What you see immediately, there is something interesting happening. I hope this is not failing on me. You see that there is an energy gap. So there is an energy range where there are no states. And of course, that's very crucial for a semiconductor. And above that, you have electron states, which you can immediately recognize again uh, with this as particles, which, you, which have a positive effective mass. And these are the holes. And you see they actually behave mo much, much the same, but now the energy goes down with increasing momentum, and that actually means that they have negative effective mass. Well, sounds a bit odd, negative effective mass, yeah, but it is purely a consequence of, of the this, this specific band structure. Of course, we call these electron states, yeah, because if you are, if you, if you, now we have to introduce a thing which is called the Fermi energy, yeah, so it basically means that in, in, in semiconductors you can have uh, electron transport when you make particles in the conduction band when you create electrons, but on the other hand, you can also take away electrons here from the valence band, then you have em empty states, they can also move, uh, and uh, well, obviously they are called holes. This is graphene, and you immediately see several differences. First of all, it is not a metal, yeah, because it, it has a very, very special band structure, because now the energy of the states depends linearly on the, on the momentum. So that's very strange, because then you cannot say that it has an effective mass, yeah, because if it's nicely quadratic, we could say it has, a, it has a, in this case, a positive effective mass, here it is a negative one. Well, here we don't know. There is, this is one imp uh, relevant feature. The other one feature is, of course, that if I fill graphene, if, let's say if graphene is neutral, Then the Fermi energy, uh, well, of course, I have to fill all these states until I have basically used up all the electrons. But then it turns out that you sit exactly at this point. And this is called the neutrality point. It is also called Dirac neutrality point for reasons which I will show. Just look at the dynamics. Let's, um, let's use Newton's law again. Suppose now I have, let's say I have an, an, a, a particle sitting here and I apply a, a force in this direction. Well, a force means that the momentum will change linearly with time. So, okay, here I go. The momentum changes linearly, and I go along this curve. So the energy starts increasing linearly. But the slope doesn't change. Eh? So dE dk remains the same, but that is the velocity. So the velocity is not changing. So I'm applying a force to this, uh, to this electron, and the velocity is not changing. It's constant. So this is a very typical aspect of graphene. Carriers in graphene always move with the same velocity. What is this velocity? It's about 10 to the 6 meter per second. 1,000 kilometers per second. If this would be the only thing of graphene, it would be a bit boring. Why? 
because these situations sometimes also occur in the band structures of metals and semiconductors. Maybe not at the Fermi energy, but a bit higher, a bit lower. And sometimes you experience this kind of crossings. But in graphene, it's, it's, well, it arises, of course, uh, from, from, well, from, let's say, the Hamiltonian in the system. So let's see, let's see how it works. Okay, now we have to, to do uh, some graphene physics. Again, this is graphene. What you recognize is that there are two sublattices, uh, these guys and, and, and these guys. So that's already one important ingredient. So if you want to describe the, uh, if you want to describe the, the, the wave functions, clearly you have to describe them on this side and on this side. And what we're going to do, we are going to describe them together uh, uh, like this. This, by the way, is, no, it's really failing on me. I have another one here. If it works, just a second. What was I saying? Okay. This separation, by the way, is about is 1.42 angstroms, right? just to, 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 to be complete. So to make the connection with the solid state picture, I go now again to reciprocal space. So now I have to go into different directions. And uh, basically, I, uh, what, I will, what I will see is that the, uh, uh, well, also in reciprocal space, you get a unit cell, which looks very much like the one in real space. And the two important points are these guys. They are the K and the K prime uh, valleys. How do you arrive at the band structure? This was done already a long time ago, Wallace. So what you do is you use a tight binding model. And a tight binding model is a little bit like a mystery. I'm not trying to explain the microscopic uh, justification for this. but you. Basically, what you say is, OK, I can have an uh, electron switch can sit on an A side and on a B side. Yes, so the A side is coupled to three B, uh, B sides. Uh, and a B side, of course, coupled to three A sides. So what actually this, this term do, does, it actually removes an electron from the B side and it puts it on an adjacent A side. So this is sometimes called the hopping, well, hopping, hopping matrix element. And the strength of this one is called T. That's, and T is measured in, in energy. So this is the one which co connects the nearest neighbors. If you like, you can also include coupling between A sides. Yeah, so this is uh, coupling this, this side couples with this one, this couples with this one, etc. And of course, also the coupling between the B sides with the T prime. Well, what you get from this was already calculated again in, 47, in 1947. This is the mathematical expression. It doesn't say too much. Uh, it's much better to look at the, at the picture. And so now we really have the 2D picture. This is the energy of the states. This is the, the, the Kx. This is the Ky. And the interesting thing is these are these, these K and the K prime points. Eh? You see that basically you, you, you would have six if you go around. Eh? But this one is equivalent to this one. This one is equivalent to that one and that one. So basically we have three, two inequivalent uh, values. And you see, recognize immediately uh, what I already plotted before. This is your neutrality point. If I go, you basically you get a, a cone. So the energy uh, as a function of the well, deviation from this k point increases linearly. And of course, here it decreases linearly. This is, uh, okay. this is asymmetric, as you see. Uh, you see this one, is, there is a much bigger change in energy uh, for electrons than for holes, and the reason for that is because of this presence of this T prime. Uh, if you forget about the T, T prime for the moment, you only connect, you only take the nearest neighbor hopping, then you get a very nice symmetric uh, band structure like this, where again you can recognize uh, the two different values. So now the, the nice thing about graphene, as I will show you, is that in the neutral case, all these states are occupied up to the Fermi energy. However, you can very easily change the, the charge in the graphene. You can make a field effect transistor. So you can clearly move this Fermi plane up and down. And then you really see what's going to happen. If you move it down, you enter the, the whole regime. 
if you move it up, you enter an electron regime. And that you, that you can very nicely measure. Why do co people call these electrons in uh, graphene massless? You've heard about that. What is this? What is this now? Massless. Well, this is basically what I already explained. If you just have classical particles which can be characterized by some mass, I have a kinetic energy like this, which I can rewrite in a as a function of momentum like this. And m0 obviously is the is the mass. There is only well, there is only one mass in, in classical physics. Eh? You have, of course, Newton's second law, which just says the force is given to is equal to the mass times the acceleration, and it's the time uh, derivative of the momentum. Uh, but now Einstein comes in and he says, hey, wait a minute, this is not fully correct. This is only correct for velocities much smaller than the velocity of light. I should actually use this equation. Yeah, so you already see that if I want to create a particle which doesn't move, well, where the momentum is zero, I still already have to put in an energy m zero c squared, yeah, which is the well, well known well-known expression, and if, I'm going to, if, I, if this particle starts to move, if the momentum starts to increase, then of course the energy starts to increase according to this relation. The interesting thing, of course, is that Newton's law, Newton's law still holds. Eh? So if I apply a force on a relativistic particle, this still means that the force is equal to the change of momentum as a function of the time. It also, uh, this one also still holds, so the velocity is still equal to the derivative of the energy with respect to the momentum. So if I plot it here, I get something like a blue curve. Okay, so this would be basically mean this is the energy, this is the momentum. I create an electron here. This will take me, uh, take me this amount of energy. Now I'm going to increase the momentum. What's going to happen? Well, you see this is in this region, it's still parabolic. Okay, so this is the classical regime. Uh, but then you clearly see when this particle is going to approach the speed of light, and then the energy starts to increase more and more linearly with the, with the momentum. And of course you also would know what it means because the velocity is not increasing anymore. And you've achieved more or less the speed of light. Uh, the only thing which is increasing is the mass. So you recognize that for graphene we had this linear dispersion. So what is now special at l l about this because this was the energy we needed to, to create a particle. It was m0 c squared. Here it looks like you, for graphene, well, that these particles more or less imitate relativistic behavior, except for the fact that m0 is zero. You do not need any energy uh, to create this particle. So, main lesson is that these electrons in graphene, they, they behave like, well, of course we know and other particles which have this dispersion, then that, that they are photons. Uh, nevertheless, electrons in graphene, they behave like charged photons, uh, so they're not real photons, but charged photons, in free space, but with a 300 times smaller light velocity. Uh, so everything is like you model, uh, make a ba ma basically make a copy of uh, particles moving in free space, approaching the speed of light, and in graphene, uh, the particles would approach this, well, would, would basically uh, have this uh, speed which is, uh, which is about 10 to the 6 meter per second. I cannot say too much about it. There are many, many nice analogies between the behavior of electrons in, in graphene and, and, and high energy physics. I'll just leave you with this message that it's something like a solid state laboratory for high energy physics. Okay. This part I like eh, because here it becomes really non-trivial. And I'll try to explain that to you. So, where now does this cone-like dispersion come from? Eh? So what is now, can we say something about that? And it turns out that yes, we can, because we can describe the Hamiltonian or appro approximate it close to either the Dirac, well, the, the K Dirac point or the K prime with, with a relatively simple uh, expression. You see that this is a Hamiltonian, it's a, a two by two matrix. It acts on the wave function on the on a vector which describes the wave function on the A sides and on the B sides. But you see it's a very special one eh, because it has only off diagonal elements. It has some com combination of the momentum in the X direction and the Y direction. And you see uh, for the K, K prime it's, it's, well, just the plus and the min minus sign are, are changed. 
So the thing I want to emphasize is that if you now calculate the wave functions, then they look like this. I've basically, I should mention, I've forgotten here the exponent ikx part, eh, or, uh, which, which, which well, according to the Bloch theorem uh, should be there. I only look at this, this prefactor. And now, and I want to illustrate that here, something funny happens. So let's assume that we have a particle which is moving with a certain momentum. And this is the x direction, this is the y direction. So I define an angle theta like this. Yeah? So more or less like this one. Yeah? So it's the arc. So 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 basically, th uh, theta is the arc tangent of of the x component divided by the y component. Eh? So then you see that corresponding to such a wave uh, to the direction, there is a, a phase factor for the wave function on the a side, and there is also a phase factor for the wave function on the on the b side. Yeah. Well, you could say so. What? Let's assume that theta is zero. Yeah. So then we get, well, let's say we had something like one one. So that would correspond with a particle going this way. Huh? Now we increase theta to pi. Yeah. So now we get this direction. I think we get i, and the other one is. So i, or minus i, I think. That should be minus i. But now the interesting thing is, now we make theta 2 pi, which actually means that we have this particle, which is moving in a certain direction. First it moves in this direction. Then it starts to move in this direction for some reason, go around. And then we are back to here. Yeah? So then you would say, well, we should get the same wave function, yeah, because it describes the same state. Uh, well, is it now so? So if we put 2 pi in this one, we get 2 pi over 2, exponent minus i pi. And here also we get the same thing. So it's like the wave function is multiplied with a factor minus 1. Yeah? And then you could say, well, who cares about that? Factor of minus 1, we, because we know that we always have to normalize wave functions, right? We have to normalize that we put some some normalization factor in, in front, so whether the, the, the wave, the, well, the, the, this is the starting wave function or it's multiplied by minus one, who cares? That turns, however, to be very, very important, and uh, as I will show you later. So we'll keep that in mind. Enough theory, experiments. Scotch tape method, what do you need? Tomorrow there will be a hands-on demonstration of this. Uh, you, can, you can try the scotch tape method yourself, see if you're good at it. Let me just explain it, how it works. So this is a nice piece of graphite. It's a nice uh, crystal. Um, in this case, it's HOPG, highly oriented paralytic graphite. Doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, now comes the trick. So we need some uh, sticky tape. It does not have to be scotch tape, just sticky tape. And we just uh, press it on the, on the side here. Yeah? Nothing special. Then we peel it off. Yeah? So remember, okay, here if you this, this, peel it off. What do you got? What's going to happen? Well, you will mean not be surprised that you will pull a, pull off a, a flake which is relatively thick. I mean, this is uh, still thousands and thousands of layers. Eh? Well, sometimes it will break already, yeah, but okay, doesn't matter. So in general, you will get, get something which still contains thousands, thousands of layers. Now comes the trick. Now you make a substrate which consists of silicon and silicon oxide. So let me, let me just illustrate it here. This is silicon, and then we have a layer of silicon oxide. And then here we have the flake, eh, with many, 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 many graphene layers. And then here was the sticky tape, and we're going to pull it off like this, right? So what would you expect? If you look at this, well, the many, many flakes, you start to pull, okay, well, maybe you pull it off completely, or, well, you will, a lot of layers will stick, and then uh, maybe 1,000 layers, and then a little bit further on, 300 layers, and then, uh, I don't know. So, but if that would be the case, this entire thing would not work. 
hey, because you will have a collection of junk on your substrate, and you, 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 you might just by chance have a small piece, which is just one layer, eh? but you will not be able to find it. The trick is, of course, that if you pr press this, this, this flake, it's still relatively flexible. If you press it against your substrate, then suppose that this last graphene layer likes to stick better to the substrate than to the next layer, eh, because we already know that the, the sticking between the layers is not so great, then there is a relatively big chance that you will pull off just, just you pull off all the flakes except the last layer. And of course it's not going to happen all the time. Uh, well, it happens about 10% of the cases or not. Uh, but, but you have a relatively big chance of, of producing single layers. And this is one of the tricks of the scotch tape. There is much more magic to it because everybody has his own technique. Uh, but this is one of the ingredients. If this would not happen, you would not, uh, Chaim and Ovozolov would not be able to, to get their nice uh, results. So here we peel it off. Okay, this is the microscope, which you see on the microscope. You see a lot of interference, nice colors. And this is a very bright one. Why? Because it's relatively thick. Uh, this is still thousands and thousands of layers. So here you really get interference of the light, uh, which is scattered back and forth. It's also scattered back and forth in this layer. Eh? So we have the silicon oxide layer here. And uh, also the, the, the thickness of this layer also matters, uh, because you can imagine that that if you tune your layers in such a way that you, you match it with a number of, uh, of wavelengths and uh, that you become more sensitive to what you put on top. Uh, so this is also a bit of the, this is also a bit of the, of, of the tricks you have to use. But now look at this guy here. This looks like the bright, the, the, this is the, the lightest you can find. Eh? The, the, the contrast is not so good. So you might say, hey, if this is the lightest which I can find and I cannot find anything else, this might be single layer, right? So what you do is you use now atomic force microscopy. So this is now uh, where you have basically your tip, which wants to keep the same force between uh, the substrate or whatever you put on it and the tip. So of course, if there is a graphene layer, it has to go up two layers. It has to go up even more, etc., etc. And you can make a, a, a picture of the height. So this is this contrast basically indicates heights. You see there is already quite some corrugation eh? in the structure, and this is because of the silicon oxide. Silicon oxide is not flat. It has some small variations of the order of a nanometer. And here there is the graphene on top. So you see really the, the graphene actually follows the, the corrugations. Here we see the next layer and the next layer, and here we go back to zero. So we scan, if we scan it, like here, there is a step here, there is another step here, a step here, and you go back to zero. And this step is, in this case, 0.29 nanometers, which corresponds more or less with the thickness of just one, one graphene layer. Now, you will immediately say, hey, wait a minute, you're not fooling me. Because if I go from here to here, I go from graphene, well, carbon, gra graphene to graphene. But if I go from here to here, I go from silicon oxide to graphene. It's a different layer. So the interaction between the tip and the material might be different. So this height might not necessarily be the real height. It, it could be bigger or, or smaller. So this experiment does not really prove hey, that if you, if you look at this one, that this is really a single layer. Hey? It, it basically proves that you, here you go from n layers to n plus one and to n plus two, but you cannot really use it as a proof that you have a single layer. So you have to do something else. So let me see, let show you what we do. <coughs> Now, now it gets a bit more expensive, so the, 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 the problem with this technique, and you already see it here, is relatively small flakes. Eh? So this is about, I should mention this, this is about 10, 10 micrometer. Eh, so the, 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 it's not going to be very commercially relevant technique, eh, because you have first have to locate where they are. So this is, a, of course, a grid of markers. So you say, well, it's between markers six on, uh, between six and seven on the x-axis, and between, what is it, four and five, and here we want to make a pattern. So now we have the bit more expensive part. Let's see. So we need EBL. So we have just the electron beam. It's basically the electron microscope. And, but instead of scanning the electron uh, beam like in a TV, uh, you can actually program the electron beam only to scan those areas where you want to make uh, contacts. And that is done here. Uh, so here we have a graphene flake, which happens to be very, very elongated. 
and we have told the machine, hey, wait a minute, scan your electron beam here, here, and here, because we want to make contacts uh, at all these positions. So, this is a device we made. We studied about three years ago. It's a ferromagnetic device. I should mention that. We have ferromagnetic electrodes, and I will tell you in the next hour why we did this. You can really recognize the graphene flake. This is, a, again, uh, a picture with an electron microscope. Uh, uh, so you, the reason why you can see it so nicely, it's only one layer thick. But, of course, the electrons which are scattered from the graphene, uh, they are scattered differently than the silicon oxide. So that is why you have such a nice contrast between this single layer graphene and the silicon oxide substrate. Here we have contacts, and this is a typical uh, size. Yeah? This is made with electron beam lithography, eh? and the reason you can see, because in our experiment we have to get the spacings between the contacts relatively short, like a micrometer or smaller. You see that these contacts are all, the width is, is much smaller than a micrometer, so these kind of dimensions it's difficult to, to obtain with optical, with light, with optical lithography, so this is done with the electron beam, because the electron beam we can really focus in a relatively small mm. area. So the graphene stays throughout the process of applying a resistance? That is a good, again, very good question. Um, um, in most cases it does. It does. Uh, yeah, so you can imagine that, of course, this, 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 uh, this solvent can creep underneath the silicon oxide and the graphene and it will roll up. That's so, that is what sometimes happens, by the way. We, can, we sometimes see it. Uh, but in, in most cases it will, it, it will simply stick. It will remain there. Don't ask me exactly why, but that's, that's a lot of chemistry and all kind of things. This is the graphene field effect resistor. So this is, the, this is why it actually works, and it's a bit of a mystery, I have to say. Um, it's a bit of magic here, because what we do, I've, I've already plotted it there. Normally what you have is a field effect resistor. It's silicon, silicon oxide, and we have a metal gate on top. Yeah, because you are interested in, in inducing carriers at the interface between the silicon and the silicon oxide. So this would be the gate, this would be the interface, and we apply a gate voltage between here and here. So we want to, to control the charge here. This is the inverse, because we now have made this, this graphene on top of the silicon oxide, and now we want to change the charge in the, in the graphene. So what we do now is we use silicon again, but we, it's very highly doped. So it does not behave like a semiconductor, it's basically a metal. And now you can see this is, this is a nice, a few hundred nanometers, it's an insulator. So you see you basically make a capacitor between this metal, metallic silicon and, and, and the graphene. So you apply, well you connect this, well this is what you connect finally to, a, to some voltage source and you apply a voltage to your silicon relative to the graphene. Typically a 10 volt, 100 volt or something like this. And the idea is, of course, if you apply a positive voltage, you will attract negative charge in the graphene. Hey, that means if we have the Fermi energy sitting here, if you want to get negative charges in, we move up the Fermi energy. If you apply a negative gate voltage, we attract positive charges, we attract holes, then the Fermi energy in the graphene goes down. So that is a very nice trick. What is also very nice is that, well, you can already understand that, that the graphene well, this, these are all the states we have talked about. There are no more states in the graphene. So all the charge which you induce in the graphene is going to be used hey, for, for electron transport. It's not that you have surface states where, where electrons can sit and do nothing. Hey, it's not there in graphene. So that's a very also important ingredient. So in, in this field effect the device, we're going to, to measure the resistance between the source and the drain. We're going to pass current from here to here, and we're going to change the voltage which we apply to the gate. Here it is. So this is a typical curve. We call this the Dirac curve. And the reason is, of course, that this is the graphene resistivity or the resistance, and here we change the gate voltage. So you immediately see a bit of nicely symmetric curve where we reach some kind of maximum. Well, is that now reasonable that we do that? Hey, the answer is yes, because suppose we apply big negative gate voltage, so we are going to attract a lot of holes, and since we are, have a lot of hole carriers, that means that the resistance or the resistivity will be relatively low. On the other side also, we apply positive gate voltage, we attract 
a lot of electrons, uh, so the resistance will again be relatively low. You see that's more or less symmetric, eh? because I've showed you that if the uh, if only the hopping is only between the A and the B sides, uh, then we get a nice band structure which is symmetric for electrons and holes. And it looks like in most cases, indeed, this is the case, eh? because you really see, well, it's not fully symmetric, eh? but uh, it's, it's almost symmetric. What is surprising here, maybe, and I should emphasize this one, is this point. At this point, we should achieve neutrality. Uh, so we are moving up this Fermi energy. Well, this is the maximum resistance we can achieve. So we sit exactly at this Dirac point. Well, you see that we, have, we need a finite gate voltage for this. Uh, and why is that? Because there is always some background charge present, for instance, in the oxide. You have to compensate, say, for that charge. And if you do that, Basically, there is no charge anymore in the graphene. Yeah? And then you might ask, hey, that is, we, I've showed you this Dirac point. It's only a point, well, two points. How can there still be uh, a finite resistivity? Shouldn't the resistivity be infinite? Yeah? So this is an important question here. What is going on there? So these are measurements of this. Uh, okay, I, mean, I should mention the... I should mention the the value here, this is typically a few kilo ohm. Now you might say, well, who cares about kilo ohms? Well, I do, because there is a combination of natural constant, it's H and E squared, which has the unit, this is the, the Planck's constant, this is the electron charge squared. If you calculate it, it's 25.8 kilo ohm. So this is very important quantity, it's the unit of conductance or of resistance, uh, and for instance, it's very relevant in quantum Hall effect. And you see now that it appears again here. Well, it's not exactly, it, this is some fraction of that value. By the way, you can check for yourself that this thing I made myself also has a few kilo ohm. So there must be a, speci a very special reason for that. So let me, let me see, this is, th okay. These are measurements where we have changed the property of the graphene. Well, what we have changed is the quality, and then this is measured in mobility. And we see that this, this maximum, or, or let's say the maximum resistance or the minimum conductivity is always around uh, 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 this 4e squared over h. If you have the time, I cannot say too much about, well, okay. I, will, I, will, I think in view of the time, I will skip this part and explain you why this is. Uh, <coughs> just mentioned a few things. So this is, this is another parameter which we need. It's called the density of states. How many states do we have available for the transport as a function of the energy? If we sit exactly at the Dirac point, the answer is clear. It's zero. Well, two points, that's zero. If you go away from the Dirac point, you know that we have this nice cone going this way. And if you go the other way, it goes like this. So it is you can actually show that the density of states, so the number of states available in a certain energy range, increases linearly on either side. And now the nice thing is, of course, well, can we now really sit here? And there are several reasons why we cannot. First of all is that the potential is never flat. It fluctuates a little bit. So this entire diagram fluctuates a little bit as a function of position. So if you then calculate some average density of states, it will always be finite. There is scattering going on. The material is not perfect. So that basically means that all these states have a finite lifetime. And now we can use some kind of uncertainty relation. We say, well, delta E is something like h bar over the lifetime. Yeah? So the shorter the lifetime, the bigger the broadening. And again, if you would broaden all these states, it's pretty clear that also here, hey, you, the density of states will increase and will become finite. Finally, there is the effect of the temperature. I am not going through this calculation, but you can actually show that if you take into account this finite lifetime uh, of the states, and the reason, one important reason is that the electrons, they, they don't move for a long distance, they are scattered already after something like 30 nanometers. Why? Because of all kind of imperfection. If you take that into account, you can actually end up with a conductance which is uh, this 2 times E squared over H multiplied by some factor pi. And the reason is you can, there is some kind of compensation mechanism. So if the material is very clean, eh, there is no broadening. Your density of state is very low. 
Now you start to induce scattering, so this the so so you will get broadening of these energy levels. So the, f the density of states will start to increase eh, because you could say the 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 density of states on either side is also going to produce a finite density here. Uh, but of course, in the, in, in the same time, the, this, this scattering time becomes smaller, and that compensates. So, so there is some fundamental argument why, for a single layer of graphene at your the neutrality point, you would get a conductance something like this. And again, that dirty piece of material also does that. So the question is, is that now also a single layer of graphene? All very nice this, but it's not yet enough proof that we have a single layer of graphene. Eh? Because we have uncertainties of a factor of two. Eh? I've shown you this AFM measurement eh? where, where the first step, eh? you are not certain about that it really measures the height. So how now? And we do not have resolution. You would say, well, you put a nice electron microscope on it eh? so that you can really resolve the, uh, the individual atoms. You cannot do that. You can do that in transmission, but not... In the, uh, let's say if you have a standard electron microscope, it does not have the resolution. Uh, so, so how now can we now get proof that we have a single layer? And this is a very important experiment which was done in 2005. So one year after the, uh, the first experiment, it was done by again Chaim and, and Ovazelov, but also by the group. Oh, huh? So the, on the previous, can I ask a question? Yeah. So. Which one? Uh, this one. Yeah. Um, so can you see from here, somehow maybe if, if the mean free pad goes, becomes larger, that the conductance doesn't increase? But, or, no. Or is this, this is the expression of this density of states as a function of the epsilon. If you, if you go away, if you increase the energy. So if epsilon, this increases linearly. So if you sit at this neutrality point, the density of states should be zero, right? But now my argument is this material has a finite mean free path, so that has a, the states have a finite lifetime. The tau is one over this, is the mean free path over the Fermi velocity, because electrons move, are scattered after a certain length. That means how, how long do they take to travel that length, which is basically this expression. This gives you some energy broadening. It's delta E is something like h bar over tau. There should be a, yeah? And so basically we, we, we basically put in this energy broadening in this one. Uh, it's a bit of a hand-waving argument. Uh, but then, and we again, okay, I should mention this, uh, I forgot to mention this equation because this is a very important one. This is the Einstein relation. It tells you that the conductivity is the density of states multiplied by E squared times a parameter which is called diffusion constant. Yeah, so but if here the graphene becomes, uh, I don't know, kind of perfect, and mean free path goes to infinity. If the mean free path goes to infinity, then obviously the, it becomes more and more perfect. The uh, density of states at the Dirac point becomes smaller and smaller. Uh, but nevertheless, so if you evaluate this formula at, at zero energy, this one goes to zero. But this one goes to infinity, because your mean free path. The electrons can travel for longer and longer distances. Yeah? And that compensates. So you end up with the same... And then still I, I end up with something like this. Yeah. Yeah? Hand-waving yeah. argument, I have, to, uh, I have to say. But this is very different if you do it in the metal. Then your density of states is, is more or less constant. Then, of course, you see that if you, if you reduce the mean free path, if the material becomes dirtier, then immediately your conductance goes down. Yeah? But here, because if you sit at this Dirac point, because of the special situation, this is what you almost get. Can, can change a factor of two or a factor of three. Okay, but, yeah. What is capital D? Sorry? What is capital D? That's the diffusion constant. So basically tells you the motion since the mean free path is, uh, the motion of this electron through this material is diffusive. 30 nanometers much smaller than a typical size. The electron moves like this and then goes a little bit like this. So this is diffusion and this motion is described by a diffusion constant and that is given in two dimensions like by half times the Fermi velocity times L. Because again, this is the typical velocity of the particles, and this is this mean free path. Yeah? Um, I'm a bit confused by the word quantized, because the way I understand it is it's, it's not really quantized, it's more like universal conductance, in, independent of your sample. Because I don't see any thing like quantization, like flux quantization or whatever. Uh, absolutely, it's not quantized in the, in, the, in the sense that it should be exactly 2e squared over h. Eh? 
But there is, as I said, there is an argument why this should be close, well, why it's of this order of magnitude. Yeah? Yeah. Yes, sir? Yeah? Uh, I was wondering about the mean free path. Is there also some energy dependence of this mean free path? For okay. Example, if it's a less linear dispersion? Again, a very good question. In this type of uh, preparation of graphene, you can say, well, it's nice, but it's always prepared on a substrate. And the substrate is silicon oxide. As I said, it's not flat. So there is always scattering going on. And actually, this type of scattering actually produces this mean free path. Yeah? So it's, for instance, de determined by the static potential fluctuations. Um, of course, you can say there is another contribution, which is due to the phonons, which is to the lattice vibrations. But that is usually not strong enough to add room, well, unless you heat it very much. It's not determining this mean free path. So graphene on a substrate is basically... Uh, uh, there, the, the, the mean free path is, 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 is determined by the scattering from the imperfections. And there can also be some junk on top. If you make the graphene suspended, which I will also show, then actually you can make this mean free path much, much longer. Yeah? I'd like to move on. This is not enough evidence for a single layer. So what was done? 2005 by Chaim and Nova Zelov, but also from the group of uh, Philip Kim, what they measured is the quantum Hall effect. And now I'm trying to, well, forget about, I'm just trying to focus on this one. So what we know is if we have, let I have to say, show a bit about the Hall effect. So I pass a certain current from here to here, I measure the, vo the whole voltage and I can define a whole resistance which is V over I. Yeah? I can also define a whole conductance which is obviously I over V and that is given, I should be careful, by NE times B over B, sorry. Yeah? So this is so that it makes sense. So if I pass this current and I measure this whole voltage, if I increase the, sorry, uh, yeah, if I increase the, uh, the density, uh, obviously my whole conduct is going to increase uh, because I have more carriers. If I increase my magnetic field, uh, my whole conductance is also is going to decrease. So this is the standard behavior. It's nothing special. It's simply the, the whole effect, in this case, in two dimensions. So if you plot this as a function, you should maybe look at this one, this is the conductivity, as a function of n, this one as a function of n, I should get more or less a straight line. This is the classical uh, Hall effect. What you get in this case is the quantum Hall effect, and I will explain what it is. But you, I will just show you why it is a bit strange, because this is at zero density, and this is, this is zero Hall conductance. Now I get a plateau, and this plateau forms at one half times this 40 squared over h. Why is this 40 squared over h? Well, the simple reason, it's four times the elementary unit. So I apparently have four possibilities for this, doing this. Well, I already had two valleys. So electrons can sit in one valley, and they can sit in the other valley. That's a factor of two. But they also have a spin. They can have spin up and spin down. You always have to take into account that each state can be occupied by two. Electric spin up and spin down. That gives another factor. So the elementary unit is 4 e squared over h, which you recognize see from here to here. But you see the first step, that is only 2 e squared over h. Yeah? So that already deviates from the normal quantum Hall effect, yeah? because then all the steps should be the same. Here the first step is 2 e squared over h, then the next one you, you add 2 e squared over h, then you, you add 4, you go to 6 e squared over h, you add 4, you go to 10. So it's an anomalous sequence of, of plateaus, which is actually a proof that you have single layer graphene. And I will try and show you why that is. Some words about the quantum Hall effect. The, 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 the the simplest way to understand the quantum Hall effect is to take a, a sample which is fully clean. So we have a 
two-dimensional sample, this is x, this is y, it is perfect and we apply a perpendicular magnetic field to the, to the system. What's going to happen? Well, inside the, 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 the material, now these electrons are going to, to, to run around <coughs> in so-called cycloton orbits. So they are pretty well, pretty useless, right? Because they are going nowhere. They just make circles. That's it. If they are, uh, they are um, at the edge, it's a different story. Eh? Because imagine now, they he wants to the electron wants to make, let's, let's forget about this impurity for the moment. Eh? Let's just look at this. The electron goes like this. It's deflected, and now it hits the boundary. It hits, tries again, tries again. So you see that at the edges, you get so-called skipping orbits. Eh? Electrons are... Well, actually producing channels where electrons on this edge can go from there to there and on this edge can go from there to there. It's exactly the opposite. So this is, I think, one already one, one important ingredient. Uh, what is also ingredient important, and please just remember this, and this is related to why, the quantum, why, why something like the quantum Hall effect can be so accurate. Suppose there is just one impurity which, which wants to interfere with this nice behavior. Well, electron comes moves around, and then scatters back, makes one circle, hits the impurity again, and continues. So it's like the impurity doesn't do anything. Yeah, so as long as the electrons which move on this edge are not able to, to go by series of scattering events to this edge, and so, so these impurities are not doing nothing. Yeah, and that is the reason why quantum Hall effect can be so accurate uh, and can be, but let's say, although of course the samples, real samples are not perfect. What I want to emphasize here is that if you do the calculation, you find that they make cycloton orbits with a frequency uh, omega c, which is given by E b over m star. Yeah? So again, these are particles, regular particles, which have a mass. They would behave like this. So the cycloton frequency does not depend on the energy. Yeah? So how now do we get, this is the classical picture, how do we get the quantum picture? Well, I've tried to have made it on the next transparency, but I like to, to show it here. <laughs> I have a periodic motion with omega c, that's the frequency. So what are my quantized levels? Well, let's assume that this would be the, the bottom of the band, here the particles would not move. I just get a nice set of states, this is a half. This is three halves, five halves, seven halves. So the energy is n plus a half times h bar omega c. Yeah, so it's it's periodic motion. So it's like more or less like a harmonic oscillator. Uh, if you quantize it, you get the levels more or less from, of the harmonic oscillator. That is what I plotted here. This is the energy. This is my Landau level sequence. Eh? So this is the zero, you could say this is the zero point motion. This is the half, this is the three halves, five halves, etc. What I also should say something if I now start to approach the, uh, the edge. So this is as a function of the guiding center of this. Well, let me show you. This is the guiding center of this, this cycloton orbit. So in the center, obviously, it doesn't matter where I put it. If I put it here or here, the energy is not going to change. And so if I do the quantized version of it, I sit, for instance, here. This is my series of, of Landau levels, as they're called. If I sit here, they're here. If I start to approach the edge, situation is changing a bit. And because then you see that this periodic motion, well, this, side, this circular motion is disturbed. I also get the periodic motion, but now they are these skipping orbits. And you can actually show that now the energy goes up. So if I, uh, if I go towards the edge, the, the energy of these Landau levels go up, yeah? like this. So why is this now so important? Because if I now change my Fermi energy, suppose it sits here, yeah? then I know that uh, I should only worry about the states which sit at the Fermi energy. All states below the Fermi energy are fully occupied. I don't have to worry about that. So the only way to get electron transport is to play a little bit with the states here or play a little bit with the states here. But these are, of course, exactly the skipping orbits. Eh? So if I put in some more electrons here, I get the net current this way. If I put in some more electrons here, I get the net current this way. So, so this is a way to understand the quantum Hall effect in terms of these edge channels. 
But remember, the sequence you get is, this is zero energy, you need a little bit energy to reach the first lambda level, then you have a nice uh, fixed sequence of, of, of states. What happens in graphene? Very different. Uh, because in graphene, the, the velocity of the particle is, uh, remains the same. It's always the same velocity, no matter at what energy you sit. Uh, so uh, so let's, let's now see. This, I have now tried to plot different uh, trajectories. Well, cycloton orbits at different energies. But the velocities are always the same. Uh, that means that if you, ha if you go... If you reduce the energy, uh, then, then you go closer to this Dirac point, clearly the cycloton frequency is going to increase. And in particular, it's going <coughs> to diverge, it become, become, become infinite. Uh, because if you sit very close to the Dirac point, you can, the electron only has to make very, very small orbits. <coughs> so this is a very, this is already important difference between the quantum Hall effect in graphene and in standard semiconductors. <coughs> There is another one, and I would like to do this before the break, and that's the Berry phase. I've already told you a bit about the fact that if an uh, electron in graphene moves in a certain direction, if it moves a certain momentum, then in the wave function itself, there is a change in phase, which looks very much, by the way, like a, 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 sp a spinor. So if you have a spin pointing in space, you can also represent it by two components, a spin-up and spin-down component, and the superposition, well, basically the superposition of that, and you can make any arbitrary angle in space. So this, this, uh, this uh, quantity is called pseudo, pseudo spin. So why is it important? Well, this is the Berry phase. Berry phase means I uh, am uh, close to the North Pole, yeah, and I basically I start to, uh, to move forward. Yeah? This, is, this is me, and this could be my, uh, my left arm. Then I start to move to the side the direction of my left arm until I, I am here. Then I move backwards again. Yeah, so what have I done? I've moved forward like this. And I've moved to the side. Yeah, and then moved like this. Yeah. So I basically said, well, uh, yeah, this is my right arm. I go like this. I go like this. And then I go back. Yeah. So my right arm, my, sorry, my left arm is still pointing in the same direction. But if I do it on a sphere, it's obviously not true. Eh? Because this was my left arm, here go like this. And now clearly I have, a, have an angle of 90 degrees. Eh? If, I, if I use, a, let's say, this part of the sphere. That is an example of the Berry phase. So the relevant one here is the Berry phase for spin and half particles. So this is now an electron. Here is a magnetic field. This electric spin. I apply a magnetic field. Yeah? So now it's, a, let's say, aligned with the field. Then I move the field. So the spin is going to move like this. I do it slowly. Then I move the field like this. Then I move the field like this. And now I'm back to the original situation. Right? So I would say, wait a minute. I, the wave function has not changed. Yeah? That turns because, I mean, I'm, I'm back in, I go like this, then I go like this, and I'll go back to the original situation, it's the same direction. But of course, remember, what can change is the phase factor. There can be a, a like this minus one, which I've shown, some phase factor in, in front. And that ex is exactly what happens. So you can show that for spin and half particles, the Berry phase is half times the solid angle. And so this means that if I, for instance, have a spin, which actually moves in the plane, Yeah, which, which I, um, I have a magnetic field which I make rotate fully and the spin follows this magnetic field then the wave function acquires an extra phase of pi hey, wait a minute, remember now hey, that was exactly the same situation which we saw hey, when we had this electron in graphene which, where the momentum basically went like this and then goes around and comes back but that is exactly the this kind of motion, yeah, because here also the momentum of the particle changes and then basically comes back to the same situation, but it has made a 30, uh, well, uh, let's say a 2 pi rotation. And because of the analogy between this pseudo spin and this real spin, this Berry phase actually tells you that there is an extra phase of pi. And 
This is the last thing which I will show before the break. What does it now mean? If we now plot the Landau levels in graphene, we find now there is a Landau level at zero energy. Yeah? Because here it's not allowed. We said if you have particles with a mass, we need this, this, this zero point motion. Uh, but basically now we have an extra phase of pi, uh, which, 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 which we take into account. So now the total phase at zero energy is already zero. So that means we have at this Dirac point, we have, as a matter of fact, we have two lambda levels. One is an electron-like lambda level, which is actually a lambda level which has moved down due to this, due this Berry phase. You could say for holes, normally for holes with a finite mass, you have the se same series, but then you go down. Well, this now has moved up. So we have this special la zero lambda level sitting there. What you also see is that the energy spacing is not constant. Yeah? As I've already told you, that is because uh, if for, for, for small energies, uh, the electron only has to make very, very small cycloton orbits, and the, and the cycloton frequency becomes much larger and it, uh, than if you go to higher energy. Let's stop and have a break until 9. Unless there are questions now. One question. I have a short question. Because you said before that because of uh, imperfections in the letters or other kind of things, the uh, band structure of graphene might deviate from the theoretical picture. And still you can observe the uh, lumbar levels Okay, uh, no, it's not correct. So uh, I, I did not say that the band structure deviates because the band structure is determined really on a relatively small scale. If you have 100 atoms, 1,000 atoms. And let's say this mean three path is 30 nanometers. So that is, that's already 100, uh, 100 lattice spacings. Yeah, so, so in principle, these imperfections or the scattering only, only modifies well, it does not modify the band structure, but, but basically gives rise to extra scattering. So if you look at this picture, what is the scattering going to do? Well, it's exactly the picture which I showed here. And this is the way which how scattering is introduced. So most of the cases, the electrons are indeed making this nice uh, motion as if they were in perfect graphene. And that, but, but then at some, here, at, at some occasions, they're basically scattered. And it's pretty clear what you need to get this, this quantum Hall effect, because you want this motion to be completed. Yeah? So the basically electrons should be within the scattering time, they should be able to complete this motion. So this is a cr criterion like omega c times tau should be larger than one. Yeah? So that is why you, in general you need also relatively high magnetic fields. Yeah? Because if magnetic fields are high, the cycloton frequency is very, very high, so the electrons can actually complete their loops before they are scattered. Yeah? Why, why is this a proof of single layeredness? Because you still have these two K and K prime values in two layers, right? Or not? You are going to tell me, you, go, you ask the question what happens in two layers? Yeah, basically. And I will answer that after the break. Okay. But now we have a break.